ever heard that phrase before? You ever thought that? You ever said that out loud? My life is over. Now, when you think about it, um, when a teenager says that, <laughs> it could mean something completely different, right? When a teenager says it, sometimes what they mean is, oh, so-and-so broke up with me, right? Or, oh, we lost the big game. My life is over. We'll never recover from that. Oh, I got another bad grade. My life is over. I'm never going to be a good student. And you think to yourself, you kind of chuckle to yourself as an adult, and you think, yeah, your life is not over. <laughs> you'll brush it off next week. You'll be back at it. Uh, you know, it's okay. But then when, it is, when an adult says it, you start to pay attention, right? And sometimes even when a teenager says it, and you know that teenager is not going through some melodrama, some typical teenage drama, you might pay attention to what they're saying. Because what they feel is an abrupt change, something that, uh, that is a surprise in their life. And uh, sometimes it comes with fear and with pain and with suffering. When your life is over, that means that most of the direction that, you're, that your life was headed in, and all the dreams and goals that go with it, are put on hold indefinitely, and sometimes, uh, sometimes indefinitely, sometimes just for a very long time, right? That's what it means when we say that our life is over. And the story that we're about to dive into is one of the greatest stories ever told, and it's made even more significant by the fact that every word of it is true. It not only defined the life of one young man, but also shifted the entire known civilization at that time to make way for the greater story of God's redemption of humanity. The story, of course, that I'm speaking of is Joseph. Over the past several months, we have picked apart and studied the lives of Joseph's father, grandfather, and great-grandfather, which in that order are Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham. These men are known as the patriarchs of the faith. While in the, over the next few weeks the story shifts focus to Joseph, his story is told within the framework of the patriarchs. Remember, his father Jacob is still alive at this point and has yet to complete his journey. And uh, you can't tell the story of Joseph without understanding first his story is also the story of Jacob, his father, and the story of his 11 brothers. The story of the patriarchs concludes with the story of Joseph. In fact, many scholars include Joseph as one of the patriarchs. They call him the fourth patriarch. Indeed, while his story has a different purpose than that of the other patriarchs, he is sort of a, a patriarch that is born out of due time. Remember when Paul said that? that? You know, he reminds me of Paul, actually, because Paul said that he was an apostle born out of due time. In other words, he didn't walk with Jesus, he didn't see Jesus die on the cross or raise from the dead, but he did see the resurrected Jesus later, and God called him to be an apostle. So he was kind of a, an apostle born out of due time, and that's the way I feel about Joseph. However, uh, he does seem like a patriarch, but I personally don't count Joseph as one of the patriarchs. While I see the comparisons being made, the Bible doesn't reference Joseph as a patriarch in later scriptures when the, it lists the three patriarchs. It's always the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? They never say Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. It's just those three that are listed as the fathers of the faith. Furthermore, Joseph is not part of the lineage of Jesus. Abraham, Isaac, and uh, Jacob are. But it's through his brother Judah that Jesus comes, not through his lineage. But while he is not listed among the patriarchs, in many ways, Joseph surpasses the patriarchs. He was a prophet, he was a dream interpreter, he was a shepherd, he was a slave, he was a prisoner, and, and most importantly, he was the most trusted advisor to the most powerful man in the ancient world. But before all that, he was a brother and a son. Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 37. We're going to skip around a little bit in this chapter as we tell the story of Joseph. 
but we do need to lay the groundwork, and uh, we're going to do so in these first 11 verses of chapter 37. Starting in verse 1, it says, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now, let me just stop there and say, we don't know what this bad report was, but... Uh, uh, he was tattling on his brothers. His brothers were doing something that, that they shouldn't have been doing, so he goes and tells Jacob. Now, Israel loved, that remember, Jacob's name was changed to Israel, so they're kind of used interchangeably. Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his uh, brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told his brothers about it and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. So the first thing that pops out to me is his relationship with his father. Jacob loved Joseph more than the other brothers, and it showed, literally, <laughs> like he gave him a coat of many colors. We all know that story, right? There's a couple of plays and a couple of movies about that coat. And that coat stands out, and for good reason. It was very expensive to make a coat with different colors. Usually it was just one color, if they even got a color. I mean, if it, if it was dyed, that dye isn't like the shirt. The shirt cost me $8 at Sam's Club, all right? It's a nice color. But we can cheaply manufacture this shirt and make it any color we want. They couldn't do that back then. And so it was a very expensive coat. And it was tailor-made just for one of his sons. I mean, that kind of favoritism doesn't sit well with anybody. And here we have 11 brothers that are jealous of him in his coat. It distinguished him from his brothers. And this infuriated them. And either Joseph was oblivious to their envious eyes, or he didn't care and he enjoyed the extra attention. My guess is that he was oblivious to it. Because if he knew what was coming... What was about to happen to him? I don't think he would have been as brazen about his, this coat and, and uh, the special treatment he got from Jacob. But does it surprise you? It doesn't surprise me that Jacob played favorites. Does it surprise you? I mean, we're talking about a man who did the same thing to his wives. He favored one over the other. He treated one with love and care and respect and uh, uh, abused the other emotionally abused her and mistreated her. So uh, it's no coincidence that Joseph is the son of the wife that he loved the most. It kind of uh, passes on from one to the other. And some things never change, do they? I mean, this story was told thousands of years ago. But we can look around, we can see people playing favorites with their kids all the time, can't we? I mean, every time I meet a, a, a child that's spoiled rotten, who's a snob, who uh, bullies other kids, the first thing I think of is what are their parents like, right? We can't help but think of it. Or if we take the opposite approach with another kind of kid, if that uh, kid is abused or neglected or attention starved, we think then as well, what must be the parents? <laughs> that was good grammar, wasn't it, Mom? What must the parents be like? 
Um, and I, I don't know, you know, that's what I think about it. I think it's only human to think that way. So it doesn't surprise me that Jacob played favorites. Jacob was a complex, a complex man who ended up better off than where he started, but he completely missed the boat on what was going on between Joseph and his 11 brothers. He was blind to his favoritism and to the consequences of that favoritism. But he was about to get a rude awakening once Joseph told his brothers and him of his dreams. Now, as to the dreams, let me just say one thing. They are not some kind of allegory that's, you know, greater than what the story is trying to say. I know a lot of people make a lot about the, uh, they make a big deal about these dreams. Really, these two dreams have one goal in mind, and it is the immediate goal that is within the life of Joseph. It predicts that one day he's going to rule over his father and his brothers. That's it. That's all it is. And these dreams, though, I mean, they, they are prophecies. And they come from God. And we know they come from God because they, they come true. Eventually, they come true. But at that time, Joseph didn't know if they would come true or not. And I don't know why for certain why he told his fathers and his brothers about the dreams. But he had to have known that they would not be received well. I think Joseph told him his dreams probably because he just wanted the truth to be made known. Boy, that's significant. He knew what they were about. He knew exactly what, what it meant. And so he's going to tell the people that it's going to affect the most. He simply told them what had happened. And his father's response was different than that of his brothers. Jacob didn't like how he who is the father and Joseph who is the son would somehow have their roles reversed. He didn't like the fact that Joseph would have authority over him. And he rebuked Joseph for the dreams. And he did so wrongly. But he kept the saying in mind. Notice the Bible says that. He kept the saying in mind. Why? Because Jacob is the man of dreams, right? Jacob himself had a dream that there were angels ascending and descending out of heaven. Jacob wrestled with an angel. Jacob was, uh, had a personal uh, connection with God. He talked to God one-on-one -on -one verbally. So he's thinking in the back of his mind, this might be true. <laughs> I might not like it, but I'm going to keep these things in mind. His brothers, however, his brothers were full-on jealous of Joseph. And at this point, they were just looking for an opportunity to do something about it. They didn't like what he said. It infuriated them. It enraged them. You know, family is one of those curious aspects of life. Family is, the, is either the reason why you succeed and why you can have a life that is morally well-balanced, where you can live at peace with all men and be able to pursue your goals and dreams, or it can be what brings your life crash, crashing down. You ever heard the saying, never go into business with family? Ever heard that saying? I have. I've been told that. <laughs> Yet there are family businesses that are super successful. That's the weird thing about family is that sometimes that's good advice. Don't go into business with family. Sometimes it's bad advice because your family works well together in business. And I've also been told uh, never sell a car to a family member for much of the same reasons you wouldn't go into business with them. Family should be the first people that you can trust. And family should be the last people that you can trust when you can't trust anybody else. But many times... They're the first that can betray that trust. Many times they're there to support you and help you achieve your goals and all, all, all that you have uh, in front of you in your life. But then many times they're the ones that are likely, the most likely to get in the way of those dreams and goals. <coughs> this is why the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, a friend loves at all times, but a brother is born for adversity. God knows that when family betrays you, it is a betrayal of the most personal kind. Right? He understands that. <coughs> it hurts. When life gets tough, when things start to fall apart, when you are supposed to be able to lean on family for help, for comfort, for support, to help mend wounds and get you back out there. But when it's family that is the source of that hurt and suffering, many times you have nowhere else to go. That's it. It's the beginning and the end. You don't know where else to go. 
So what did Joseph's brothers do to betray him? Well, it all started when Jacob uh, asked Joseph to go out into the wilderness to check up on his brothers and see how they were doing while shepherding in the field. Well, the last time he did that, he brought back a bad report, right? So, you know, and then he goes and tells him his dream that he's going to rule over him. Those are two strikes against him. Maybe three at this point if we're following the baseball analogy. But he goes to Shechem where they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be out shepherding the sheep out in Shechem. And when he gets there, they're not there. But there's a man that's there. The Bible says we don't know who that man was, just a stranger. And the man says, what are you doing out here? And he says, well, I'm looking for my brothers. And uh, his, uh, uh, this man said, well, I think they, they went on to Dothan. Well, Dothan was even further away from home. But he goes out to Dothan, and, and uh, as he's approaching his brothers way off in the distance, his brothers see him. And they huddle together, and they, they conspire against him. And they say, we're, you know what? We're tired of this guy. We're tired of, of him uh, you know, getting everything over us, and now he's telling us he's going to rule over us. He's done. We're, we're done with him. Let's kill him. Let's throw his body into a pit and lie to our father and say that uh, a wild animal got to him. And we'll be done with them forever. So they're conspiring against him and they're, they're wanting to kill him. And Reuben, the oldest brother, speaks up. And he says, you know what, we're not, let's not do that. Let's not let his uh, blood be on our hands. Just throw him in the pit and, and uh, that's it. Don't, don't kill him. Take his coat, do whatever you want to his coat. But don't kill him, just throw him in, uh, throw him in the pit. So what he was going to do is he was going to wait till they left and then go and rescue Joseph and bring him back to Jacob. I mean, how brave, right? He really stood up to his brothers, didn't he? Well, as uh, you know, Joseph gets closer, they grab him, they strip him of his coat, they throw him in the pit, then they sit down to eat. And Judah uh, sees uh, a group, a caravan of Ishmaelites walking by. And he says, you know what? Why should we kill him? That does, that does us no good, and, and his blood will be on our hands. Why don't we sell them to the Ishmaelites and make a little profit on them? At, at, at the very least, we'll make some money. We won't have to worry about killing them, and it'll be out of our lives forever. So they agree that's what they're going to do. And so they sell uh, Joseph to the Ishmaelites, and uh, Joseph becomes a slave to the Ishmaelites. And they leave. And then Reuben, who wasn't there for some reason, I don't know why, but when he comes back, the Bible says he tears his clothes in shame, and, uh, and he cries out, and he, he was too late. It was too late to rescue his brother. Joseph is gone. So what they do is they tear his robe up and they, they slaughter a goat and they dip the blood of the goat in the, they dip the robe in the blood of the goat and they take it back to Jacob. And when Jacob sees the coat, the Bible says that he cries out in grief. And he is so overcome with grief, he can't eat, he can't sleep, he won't talk to anybody, nobody can console him. I don't know what they were thinking. I, I, his favorite son has been slaughtered by an animal ruthlessly. What do you think? Uh, what would they think was going to happen, right? That he was going to be like, oh, you know, I'll get over it. No, of course not. So whatever they were trying to accomplish didn't happen with Jacob. Because Jacob is now in a, in a uh, period of mourning. And nobody can talk him out of it. So that's what happens to Joseph. And all this makes me wonder, why did they come up with this elaborate plot which they knew was going to end with their father being a miserable mess of a man? Why didn't they just sit down with Jacob and say, Dad, I tell you, you got to cut this out. I mean, you got Joseph, you know, doing reports on us and bringing back reports and tattling on us. You, you know, you got him wearing, you got this fancy coat for him and we're just dog meat to you. You got to stop doing that. You got to act right. And why didn't they just sit down and talk to their father? Or why didn't they sit down with Joseph and say, look, dad doesn't listen to us. He listens to you because you're the favorite. We all know it, right? So go and talk to your father and tell him that he's got to stop doing this. It's, it's making us angry and it's, it's causing a disturbance and a peace among, um, um, amongst the family. Why didn't they do that? Well, we don't know if they did. Maybe they did do that and it just didn't work. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But we know why they did what they did do. The reason why they did what they did was because of poor character. 
They never had the moral compass they needed to make wise decisions. Remember a while back when I preached on, last time I preached on the patriarchs, when we talked about Simeon and Levi, two of Joseph's brothers who went on a murderous rampage when they found out that uh, their sister was raped. Remember when that happened? They killed a whole town full of men. They just went on this murderous rampage. They took matters into their own hands. And taking matters into their own hands was already in the mix in terms of poor judgment and bad character. Add a strong uh, bit of brotherly envy and you have a recipe for hatred and backstabbing. Even Reuben and Judah are just a couple of weak-willed hypocrites. <laughs> what do they do? They're, they're, oh, they're clever, right? They save Joseph from being murdered. But they don't stand up to their brothers. They don't say what you're doing is wrong, okay? And uh, you may say, well, they didn't have the Ten Commandments at this time. They didn't have the Law of Moses. They didn't have any laws guiding them. Well, that's no excuse because the New Testament says from the time of creation to the time of Moses, they had the law written on their hearts. They already knew the law. They already knew they shouldn't murder. And we're going to see next week, mostly, we're going to see how their, uh, the 11 brothers compare to Joseph when it comes to making moral decisions on their own. They failed. Joseph did not fail. So we know that you can have good character because God created us in, in his image and printed the law of God on our hearts so that we can have conscience, so we can have a moral compass, and they ignore it. Joseph's family did more than fail him. They betrayed him. They left him alone and destitute. They turned his back on him, and eventually he ends up in shackles. Now put yourself in Joseph's shoes. How would you feel about what your brothers just did to you? How would you feel? Would you be angry? Maybe he was angry. Maybe he just was waiting for the day. He just started counting the days that those shackles would come off and he could go back and exact revenge on his brothers. Like the Count of Monte Cristo. Remember that story? And how, uh, how the main character in, in, in that story ends up being framed. He goes to jail. He spends years in prison. And he spends the entire time in prison plotting his revenge on his best friend that framed him. And then he gets out and he's able to exact revenge in the most perfect way possible. And the whole story unfolds. And then he realizes that he, he, he didn't need to take revenge at all. It was, just, it was just an emotional response, right? Maybe he was angry and he was plotting his revenge. Maybe he was just confused. Maybe he's just thinking, why are they doing this? And he's going back in the, into his memory. He's trying to think of the times that he made his brothers mad or he made his father mad. And, and he's trying to think, he's just racking his brain wondering what went wrong. And he can't think of anything. Maybe he's just shell-shocked. One day he's, he's out looking for his brothers, trying to help them, trying to do what his father said. Next moment, he's naked in a pit. He's being sold off to a bunch of foreigners and and enslaved. And he just, he doesn't have any thoughts. He's just shocked. You would think, no matter what, confused, angry, or shocked, you would think your life was over, right? I know I would. My family turned their back on me. My father thinks I'm dead. I'm sold into slavery. My life is over. That's what I would think. An abrupt change that comes with pain and suffering, that changes all your hopes and dreams, and puts all that stuff on hold, I think my life is over. And one of the most human things about us is when we get like this. We, because all we can see is what is directly in front of us. We can't see behind us. We can't see ahead of us. We can't see what God's doing in the midst. And we just think, that's it. My life's over. I'm done. I don't know what I'm going to do next. Lost a job? You're not thinking of the next job. Lost a loved one? You're not thinking about seeing, again, uh, seeing them again in heaven. You're just dealing with the grief. Go through a tough breakup or a divorce. You're not thinking about marriage or how there's other fish in the sea. A family member does something horrible to you. You're not thinking about what it's like to forgive them and make amends with them. It is a very human thing to think about what's just right in front of you. And you don't think about what could be or what God's doing. At that moment in time, Joseph is not thinking about maybe, just maybe, one day I'll be the second most 
powerful man in the known world. And not only that, but I will rule and be at peace with my murderous, stab backstabbing brothers. <laughs> He's not thinking about that. He's not. But we are. We're thinking about that form. You know why? Because we know the end of the story. We do. We know how this ends up. We're thinking about it because it's written down in Scripture. And I just want to shout at Joseph, hang in there, Joseph. You're just beginning your long and arduous journey. You aren't even at the worst part yet. But hang in there because it's going to get better. Hang in there because you're going to look back and you're going to see exactly what God was doing in your life. Hang in there. Reading about these people in the Bible honestly makes me feel a little bit omniscient. Now, I'm not trying to say something blasphemous here. I'm not saying I'm all-knowing and I'm God and all that. But when we read the Bible, we can see how their story starts out, where it goes, and where it ends up. And we can see the whole thing play out right in front of us as if we can time travel. Like God. Because <laughs> God does know everything. But unlike God, He knows our past our present, and our future. For him, it's already written out. We may not be Bible stories that people can study years and years later, but for God, it doesn't matter. He knows our beginning, he knows our middle, he knows our end. He knows it all. It's all written in his head. It's all preordained. And God's sitting up in heaven saying to us, hang in there. He wants to scream at us. You may be going through hard times, but hang in there. Hang in there, right? Davis, hang in there. You may be going through a hard time right now with your family, but hang in there. Amy, you may have had a couple of hard weeks, but hang in there. God's still got plans for you. Bob, you, you, you may have had a couple of hard years, but hang in there. You may be going through a hard time, but hang in there. Why, do, why can I say that? Do I know your future? No, but God knows your future. And he told us what your future is. If you know Jesus, if you are his son, his child, you know your future. And I can tell you something. As a, as a Christian, when I look at the way other Christians who are being persecuted right now, who are, are suffering or in jail or are being beaten, executed because of their faith, and that's all they have. They don't even have their family. All they have is their faith. And they can say to themselves, hang in there. If they can do it, I can't. Why? Because we all end up in the same place as Christians. We all end up with an eternity in heaven with God forever. So we can't say, hang in there. Look, we may not be the advisor to Pharaoh. We may not be the second most powerful person in the world like Joseph will end up being. But we will have perfect bodies. We will have a perfect reunion with our loved ones. We will be with the church singing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to God in the highest. And we're going to be with them forever. So I can say, hang in there. Not based on anything I've done or anything you guys have done. Not based on your circumstances. But based on the nature of God. And based on His will and His determination and His plan. I can say, hang in there. So when you're going through something tough, remember, you may be at the first chapter of a broader life, of a broader story. And Joseph, not only is he going to be able to reconcile one day with his brothers, but he is going to turn world history on its head. He's going to change history, and it's going to lead to, honestly, it's going to lead to the redemption of humanity. Hang in there, Joseph. This is just the first chapter. And as our uh, praise team makes her way up here for our song of response, it's just exciting to me. That's all. It's exciting that I can read Joseph and, and know that he's being taken away in shackles. He's being in, uh, one day he's going to face prison for something he didn't do. Actually, for something he did right. And then he's going to be forgotten about. Everyone is going to forget about him. Except for God. And he's going to take all that muck and mire and he's going to say, you, you think you're looking at the bottom? You're at the bottom of the barrel? What happens when you're at the bottom? You have nowhere to look but up. 
God says hang in there, guys. So hang in there. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for being that God who never leaves us, never forsakes us, is always present in our lives. And I look back on my life and I see the dark times ahead of me. I look back on my life and I see that, that uh, there are times where I was confused, where I was facing uncertainty and I didn't know what you were doing and I thought my life was over. I thought it was over. Now I can look back and see your hand at work. And the next time it happens, I can say, nope, it's not going to happen this time because I know that God's got a bigger plan for me in store for me. We thank you for that certainty, Lord. We know it's based on your son, Jesus, and only him alone. I pray, Lord, that everybody can experience that. That feeling that Joseph only got to experience later in life. That the plans that you have for us are greater than we can imagine. In Jesus' name.